Today we have come to remember and to pay our respects to those who pay the ultimate price in conflicts around the world. We also take time to think of those who are currently serving in the armed forces or who now live as civilians within our communities. But we're also going to ask a question of ourselves today. And this, what are the challenges the world is facing today? And how might we respond to these? We will come back to this question as we journey through our time of remembrance during this service. So we start with our call to worship. If you are familiar with how churches do things, this you could say is our starter's whistle. Calling us to come together to meet God in prayer, mindful that we don't have to walk through this life alone. Psalm 21 says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The Lord keeps watch over you as you come and go, both now and forever. So please join with me in this prayer and I invite you to share in responding with the red font. We meet in the presence of God to remember the past, to pray for today and to live in hope for the future. We commit ourselves to work in penitence and in faith for peace between the nations that all may live together in freedom and justice and peace. We pray for all who continue to suffer the effects of fighting and terror through loss, disability and pain. And we declare our hope in God who promises to give us who promises to bring an end one day to conflict and war, to wipe away the tears and sorrow and make all things new. Amen. So join with me as we come to our first hymn, God Our Help of Ages Past.
earlier, I asked us to consider the question. What challenges does the world face and how might we respond? There are many challenges that face us today. Arguably the biggest three of the are climate change, the modernization of global nuclear weapons and COVID. There's probably other challenges that grab your imagination too. Do we feel that we are able to meet these challenges? 100 years ago, our forebearers faced this challenge too. The biggest challenge that they faced was the world descending into the first ever global war. One particular person, a young man called William Watson, tried to consider how he could help. He wasn't a politician, a great religious leader or a peacemaker. He was just a young man who liked riding motorbikes. And then he heard that the army was looking for motorcyclists who could come and become dispatch riders working on the Western Front. So he signed up. A few years ago, I was involved in the filming of a documentary following this very person, Captain William Watson, on his adventures during the First World War. So I would like you to introduce you to a young person I used to be the youth worker to. So I would like to introduce you to Sam McKinvan, a member of the Kent Young Bikers, a, a youth work project I used to run, as she takes us on a venture following the tyre marks of Captain William Watson's motorbike as he rode around the Western Front. broke out on the 28th of July 1914 after the assassination of Franz Ferdinand, heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The assassination sparked a diplomatic crisis that drew the Austro-Hungarian Empire together with Germany against the Allied forces of Britain, France and the Russian Empire. In France, Allied forces clash with Germany, leading to a deadly stalemate forming the Western Front. Both sides dug in to fight a long war of attrition. Attrition warfare is a deliberate attempt to wear the opponent down through inflicting continual heavy losses or damage, eventually leading to the opponent being defeated. Both forces excavated trenches which spread from the North Sea to the border with Switzerland in the south. These trenches were seen as some of the worst fighting in the war as one side attempted to wear down the other. At the start of the hostilities, the War Office sent out an appeal for motorcycle dispatch riders. Men and women alike took up the call. Men mainly served on the front line, while women, who were not allowed to fight, served as dispatch riders behind the lines, with the Women's Royal Naval Service. Other women served as drivers and mechanics, freeing men to fight on the front line. Motorcycle dispatch riders played an essential role on the Western Front. Radio and telephone communications could be intercepted by the enemy, so orders and information were sent by motorcycle courier. A dispatch rider also had to deliver equipment and transport occasional personnel. Maps were often of poor quality and in short supply, 
and the exact location of troops was often inaccurate. Dispatch riders had to learn to locate battalions and develop knowledge of the area. Captain William Watson was one rider who served with the Royal Engineers Signal Service on the Western Front in 1914. Like many early dispatch riders, he initially used his own motorcycle. Later on, the Army supplied motorcycles manufactured by Douglas and Triumph. Watson wrote the book Adventures of a Dispatch Rider, recounting his experiences on the front line. On a motorcycle, if you're going rapidly, you cannot hear bullets or shells coming, or even shells bursting unless they are very near. Running slowly, with the engine barely turning over, you can hear everything. So I went slow and listened. Through the air came that sharp whooping sound of the shrapnel bursting towards you. The most devilish sound of all, but nothing frightens me as much as the shrapnel shriek. I was sent out to find General Gleechin, who was reported somewhere near Wasmay. I went over nightmare roads, uneven cobbles with great pits in them. We had already heard guns, but on my way back I heard a distant crash and looked around to find that a shell had burst half a mile away on a slag heap between Dower and myself. With my heart thumping against my ribs, I opened the throttle until I was jumping at 40 miles an hour from cobble to cobble. Then realising that I was in far greater danger of breaking my neck than being shot, I pulled myself together and slowed down to proceed sedately home. After the Battle of Mons, feeling let down by the French, British soldiers retreated from the German advance. Watson helped army divisions keep in contact as the British expeditionary force moved towards Paris. From his various trips, Watson reported that morale was high among the troops. Most soldiers blamed the French for the retreat, believing the battle could have been won. The retreat was seen as a tactical withdrawal rather than a defeat. Riding back I heard some shouting, a momentary silent, and then a flare of the finest blasphemy. I turned the bend to see an officer holding his severed wrist and cursing. He was one of those dashing fellows. He had ridden alongside the transport, swearing at the men to get a move on. He held up his arm to give the signal when a ricochet took his hand cleanly off. So let's join together for our second hymn. Seek ye first the kingdom of God.
Friends, let us remember in silence before God all those who have died in wars, remembering all who have suffered and committing ourselves to the work of peace. They shall not grow old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we shall remember them. Everlasting God, we remember those you have gathered from the storms of war into the peace of your presence. May that same, may that same peace calm our fears, bring justice to all, establish harmony among the nations, inspiring us to come together peacefully to problem solve the challenges that the world faces today. In your name, Amen. Children, justice, joy, peace, sun.
to an end in November 1918 when Russia's government collapsed in the east and the Allies won victory over the Germans in the west. By the 11th of November the war was over. After the war battlefield cemeteries and memorials were constructed around Europe. Vimy Ridge was built commemorating 11,000 Canadian soldiers whose bodies were lost on the battlefield.
William Watson visited Ypres early in 1914. It was to become the site of five major battles during the war. The first battle took place between the 19th of October and the 22nd of November 1914. In this battle, the British forces were outnumbered by two to one and under-resourced. During the battle, 30% of the army were killed and numerous more soldiers wounded. The final battle occurred in 1918. By the end of the war, every single building in the town had been risen to the ground. Menin Gate, located in Ypres, is one of four British and Commonwealth memorials designed by Sir Reginald Blomfield. Inscribed in the walls are the names of 54,000 men missing in action, with no known grave. Every day at 8pm we hear the sounding of the last post, remembering the sacrifices of these soldiers. This ceremony has become part of daily life for those living in Ypres. was radically changed after the war. Empires fell, forgotten nations found new independence and new nations were born. A new world organisation, the League of Nations, was created to maintain international cooperation and world peace. It failed in this task and the world would be at war once again within 20 years. William Watson left the front by 1915, but motorcycle dispatch riders continued to play an active part in the war effort. Watson died in 1932, aged 41. Sir John French, Commander-in-Chief, said of the contribution made by dispatch riders to the war effort. Carrying dispatches and messages at all hours of the day and night, in every kind of weather, and often transversing bad roads blocked with transport, they have been conspicuously successful in maintaining an extraordinary degree of efficiency in the service of communications. Many casualties have occurred in their ranks, but no amount of difficulty or danger has ever checked the energy or ardour which has distinguished them throughout the operation. And all these people died, still believing that God had promised them. They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it all from a distance and welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on earth. Obviously, people who say such things are looking forward to a country they can call their own. If they had longed for the country they came from, they could have gone back. But they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith, yet none of them received all that God had promised. For God had something better in mind for us, so that they would not reach perfection without us. Therefore, 
Since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God hath set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and now he is seated in the place of honour beside God's throne. May the Lord give us understanding of his word. Amen. There are many of us who have not served and cannot hope to imagine what it's like to be in the armed forces. People can join up for many reasons. But I think those reasons might include some of these. One person might look at the world around, seeing that there's something wrong with it and wants to make it better. Alternatively, another person might have one of those epiphany moments. They suddenly realise that this, this everyday thing called life is a beautiful thing and it's worth defending. For whatever reason, people might sign up. They have a sense that the world should be a better place. It might be hard to put in words. It might be intangible. But in some small way, many people who sign up want to make this place better. This attitude is world building. It is an act of creation. Imagine the world years from now. This future world has not yet started to take shape and we certainly can't see it yet. But despite it not yet existing, the future world is worth planning for, creating, defending and maybe fighting for in the here and now. These might have been some of the motivations that people such as Captain Willie Watson might have experienced when signing up to join the armed forces. So let me ask you the question again. What challenges are, is the world facing and how might we respond? During the filming of the Rev Memorial Ride, we visited memorials such as Vimy Ridge, the memorial commemorate, commemorating fallen Canadian soldiers and the Menning Gate in Ypres, designed by Sir Reginald Bromfeld. Both of these memorials have the names of thousands of soldiers killed in battle with no known grave. Their names inscribed on the very walls of those memorials. And when you put your hand out and touch those walls and almost put your finger into the very inscribed letters of those names, you're reaching out across the generations to touch the soldiers who'd lived before us. And it makes you wonder if you could have a conversation with those soldiers of the past and if you could tell them how the world had turned out today, would they be happy? Would they say their sacrifice was worth it? I hope so. Our presenter Sam McKinvan was one of those young people who had never really thought before about why the World Wars had happened and what it meant for her and her life. But the trip we took to Belgium in 2014 profoundly affected her. So much so that she visited the Western Front several years later, bringing a friend with her wanting to share her experiences with that friend. 
Now, let's consider our scripture reading from the book of Hebrews. The context of the reading, familiar to many people, describes a Jewish hall of fame, similar to those memorial walls where soldiers' names, listing hero after hero, had died to make Israel a better and safer place. Those people could not see what the future held, but they too laid down their lives for that future. But they also have their eyes on another place, another country, the heavenly country, the place where God resides beyond the human senses, a place where we are invited to ultimately spend eternity. The heavenly country inspired them to make this world a better place. You see, the heavenly perspective is essential. It reminds us that this planet is good and that everyone can be redeemed. It also reminds us that there is so much more to life than the physical world we sense with our five senses. This heavenly perspective can have the deepest encouragement to us and I'm certain that many soldiers had a faith such as this. Often we think that deaths on the battlefield can be violent and lonely events, which they are. But our scripture reminds us of a wider vision. There is a great cloud of witnesses beyond our senses, encouraging us to keep going, to keep the faith. At the end of, the, of this journey we call life, there is a finish line. And Jesus is waiting there, calling to us and encouraging us to keep going. Jesus is the centre of this grand vision and he's described as the author and perfecter of our faith. You don't need to be a soldier to see that this world faces threats and challenges and to decide to do something about it. There are countless people I could think of who are already doing this. Hundreds of people have pilgrimaged to Glasgow to remind the politicians at COP26 that we need to act fast to save the planet from drastic global warming. I fear that Greta Thunberg and former President Barack Obama are right when they say the politicians aren't doing enough. Obama tells young people to stay angry in the fight against climate change. If you want to make this world a better place, then let me tell you this. The God who made the universe agrees with you. This world should be a better place. That is why we pray the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. But you don't have to take the battle on alone, because if you do, I fear that you may become disillusioned, burnt out, or the scale of the task could be so large it has a negative effect on your mental health. And Remembrance Day, if anything, is a sober reminder that humanity does have a darker side. Year after year, we return to this very date, remembering more people who've died and adding other battles and skirmishes to the list. Many of us are broken, wounded, and in dire need of love and forgiveness. This is why we need the transforming love of God to guide us. This is made possible by the death and resurrection of his son Jesus Christ. God calls us as we are to seize and share his vision. To make this world a better place 
and to dream of a world that hasn't yet taken shape. We might not see it in our lifetimes. But God encourages us to gain the heavenly perspective. And when we reach the heavenly country, we too will be cheering on the next generation who themselves are learning those very words taught by Jesus Christ. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Loving and eternal God, we thank you for the women and men of the armed forces, past, present and future, who have made the ultimate sacrifice. We thank you that they were motivated to make this world a better place. We pray for those who have been affected by terror, for those who have been killed, for survivors and for their friends and family. May your loving presence be with them as they rebuild their worlds. We pray for military personnel who have returned to civilian life. May you be with them as they just back to life at home. Be with those who have been traumatised by conflict, those who have been made homeless because of their experiences, and those who have not resettled well. Teach us as a country to value and care for our armed forces and our veterans. We pray for those who suffer from increased anxiety because of the challenges the world faces. Lord Jesus Christ, may they find comfort in you. Call us to follow your Son, Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Help us to recognise your voice, even if it is for the first time. Thank you that you call us all to make heaven on earth. We ask this in your name. Amen. Please join me as we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And we finish with our final hymn, reminding us of that grander vision beyond our own lives that calls to us to make this world a better place. Be thou my vision.
so as we finish our time of worship, let us conclude in prayer. Merciful God, calm the fears of our hearts. Fill us with your perfect love and give us hope to make a future. Living lives for justice, courage and mercy. Through Christ Jesus. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.